Cheryl needs no introduction. She's a frequent person, musician, contributor to our church life, and she's going to be our speaker today. Won't you come forward? Good morning. I think I can fit all this in? No, I'm not. My other lectures are all in, don't get worried. I'm really, really, really thankful this morning because Susan called me the other day and said, I just wanted to give you a heads up, but there's this horrible smell in the fellowship. And we think maybe something, being, you know, we're very inclusive here, something may have crawled underneath the fellowship. And so I just wanted to give you a heads up. So when I walked in this morning and it was all gone, and it smelled really good. I was just really thankful because I thought I was going to have to change my talk to something about Jesus in the manger because the ambience would have been good and I could have led a meditation and said, you know, smell the stable, smell the animals. So you're safe from that today, anyway. So I am going to tell you some stories. And I love to tell stories because I think they reach people at a different level. And But have you ever told a story and someone laughed at you and said, that is not true, that is an urban legend. Okay, because I've had this happen to me a number of times and got kind of embarrassed. If you don't know what an urban legend is, I looked it up. It's a humorous or horrific story circulated as though true, especially one purporting to involve someone vaguely related or known to the teller. Okay? But you know, some urban legends are actually true. They may not come from the same source, but they come from a common quality that human beings have. Great creativity and incredible foresight. <laughs> so, so if you've ever read or, or seen the Darwin Awards on, uh, on the internet, those are incredibly embarrassing and stupid ways that people have died. Um, that are true stories. So my story is a family story that was passed on to me as a child, although the specific names and places have been changed to protect the innocent. Um, my family spent many happy hours as a child mulling over the incredible stupidity of the human race, in which the following story would almost surely come up. And I remembered my grandmother specifically telling this story because she had apparently gotten the phone call um, then my mother told it, and now I'm telling it. And somewhere out there is someone saying, thank God that Snopes is reporting this as an urban legend because this was my family. So this is a true story, no matter what Snopes is saying. And um, a relative of mine in my grandparents' generation um, was visiting somebody in the hospital uh, that was sick in my family. And they noticed that there was someone in the next bed who was in a body cast, like head to toe, really not in good shape here. Um, and after going in and out many days, they were just so curious as to what had happened to this person that they got friendly with the people that were visiting. And that they got, to, they actually asked what had happened, you know, what, what had happened to this person. And this is the story that they were told um, by their visitor. The man in the body cast, we'll call him John, no particular reason, John, <laughs> I just picked John before you got it, was afraid of heights. And he needed to work on the roof, and he didn't have anybody who could actually do that. And so he desperately needed this work done, and he had to come up with a creative idea to make himself feel okay about doing this. And so he came up with this great idea. And he worked out this safety harness thing in his mind. And John first secured the end of the long rope, okay? And then he tied it to something a little heavy and he threw it over his house. It was only a one-story house. And then he ran around back and he climbed up the ladder and he tied himself off at the waist. Um, and, you know, sounds like a good idea. But he was on the other side of the roof, so he, you know, it, was, it felt really secure and it felt good to him. So he tugged on the rope, and it was great, everything was great, and uh, he was doing really well. The problem was that the anchor to the other end of the rope was tied to the bumper of the family car. 
Now, in the old days, bumpers were those big, heavy chrome things, so they were, you know, pretty sturdy. So, you know, he thought it was really secure, wasn't going anywhere. He thought it was kind of perfect, brilliant, as uh, Father Nigel Mumford would say. Except that he forgot to tell anyone that he had done this. And his wife decided to pop on down to the grocery store. So she hopped in the car, never thinking to look at the back bumper because she was looking at her list. And who would think to specifically look to see if your car was tied to the house or your husband? And she drove off. And it gets worse because actually she did not hear her husband being dragged by the car and she drug him a little ways down the road before she realized something was amiss there. I guess the car just didn't have as much pickup as usual. <laughs> so this is how poor John found himself in the hospital in a full body cast. And the origin of at least one version of the story, and I looked it up on Snopes, there was actually another story about a gentleman in South Africa who had done the same thing. And they actually gave his name, this poor man, um, but of course, Snopes said it, they couldn't really prove one way or another that this was true, but I'm telling you that this is a true story. And I actually had to work on the roof one day, and I was getting up, I was trying to, David's afraid of heights, so I was trying to put some lights up, and I had a step ladder, not one that leans up, and I somehow got myself up on the roof and then was petrified to swing my leg back down to get down. And so, you know, I thought about this afterwards and I thought I totally understand where the guy got this idea. And I'm glad he already worked it out. So you might be wondering why in the world I'm telling you this story besides don't do that. <laughs> don't try this at home. Well, before I speak, I always ask, what is it that people most need to hear? Because it changes every day, depending on what's going on. And so last week, David asked me what I was going to speak on, and I said, well, you know, I don't know yet. I'm, I'm kind of waiting for spirit. Sometimes something just bubbles up, and I just know that that's what I need to speak on. That's what people need to hear. And, uh, and so I woke up Saturday morning with this story in my mind that had absolutely nothing to do with anything that I had heard lately. And I thought, why in the world am I thinking this of about this story for it. And then I remembered what I had asked because I had been asking it before I went to sleep. And I thought, this? This is what you want me to tell people? You know, this is, this is a little out there. Really? But then I thought about the aftermath of that story that nobody in our family had really talked about. So the untold part of the story, what happened after the husband got out of the hospital? Firstly, it was an accident, we assume, okay? We assume his wife would have been horrified, which brings up the whole issue of forgiveness, big time, and judgment as well. And I thought, oh, I get it. So did he forgive her? Did he blame her? Did he label her careless? Did he call her an idiot? Did she forgive him for not leaving a note on the car and telling him, telling her what he was doing? I'm afraid there might have been a lot of idiots flying back and forth here. But deeper than that, did they forgive themselves? The Casey readings said that sin merely meant missing the mark and that forgiveness was one of the most common sins on this earth plane. But even more than that, the biggest one was an inability to forgive self. So did he forgive himself for not leaving a note on the car? Did, for his fear of heights, did he judge himself to be an idiot? Did she forgive herself for being the cause, although unwittingly, of her husband ending up in the hospital in a body cast? Did she judge herself for being distracted and not seeing the road. So this was Saturday morning when I got the answers as to what people most needed to hear about forgiveness and judgment. 
And the Wednesday before, as we all know, a young man, 19 years old, entered a school and shot 17 kids and teachers. And normally the shooter is killed. But this young man is still alive. And he will most likely for a very, very long time live with what he's done. So what happens when the shooting is over, when everyone is presented with the idea of forgiveness, which is probably the hardest word to contemplate in a situation like that. And everyone is presented with the opportunity to judge this person, this boy. Because if any of you have ever had a teenager, you know that they're not yet a man at that age. You know what I'm saying. So before I moved to Virginia Beach, uh, many of you probably don't know, I was doing play therapy um, in children's, a children's hospital preschool program for the emotionally disturbed. And they were four to six years old. Um, there were eight kids in a classroom and there were two teachers. Sounds like good odds until you have one kid, you're trying to hold one kid from throwing those little heavy wooden chairs at the other children, and the other kid is running around trying to stab the other kids with a little plastic knife that you just made snack with. So they really, really kept us busy. But let me be clear, those kids were not emotionally disturbed. They were not mentally ill. I read their files, their family histories, and their backgrounds, and what they had endured. They were survivors. They had what we would now call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And they were angry little souls at four, five, six years old. And they were incredibly resilient human beings. And I used to ask myself, when I looked into the eyes of one of these little children when they were really angry, I would ask myself, what is that gonna look like when they end up being a teenager and they have some strength behind it when the knives weren't plastic anymore and the chairs were not two feet high if their situations didn't change if they didn't get the help that they needed we don't often see the shooters photos of the shooters as little kids do we what we see is the craziest looking photo that the media can find but no one snapshot tells the story of a person's entire life. How many people have deleted a photo that somebody put on Facebook or something that someone took of you at an inopportune moment when you look completely insane because you were telling somebody some exciting story and maybe you could see the whites the whole way around your eyes or maybe you were eating and you made a face because it was sour and they got you just at that moment. Think about if that was the picture that they would put in the paper of you. How would that seem to be to you? Would people say, look at that. That explains everything. But it doesn't explain anything. When I first came to Virginia Beach, I was in the massage school at um, ARE, the Casey Riley School, and I was in a classroom where the first thing we got to do with about 15, 20 people, I can't remember how many exactly, we sat around in a big circle and we told kind of Reader's Digest versions of our life stories. And people came from all kinds of different backgrounds. It was really fascinating. And we listened and we listened and we got to the end of the period and there was one person left. And that woman that was sitting there, I had been seeing her come in and she was very cool and very professional and was seemed to be um, sort of unmoved by other people's stories. She looked very together. And my presupposition was when we got to her, she wasn't going to have a very interesting story. And, you know, she looked like she was having a good life. When it was her turn, before she even spoke, she burst into tears. And she could hardly get out her story. And she had been from such an abusive family background that she had to change her name. And we became really, really good friends. And she never would tell me what her original name was. 
So what I'm saying is that we have a lot of presuppositions. And you can't tell from looking at someone what they've been through. And you can't even tell by what you read in the papers because they don't have access to the histories of these kids because of confidentiality. And actually, people that would foster these kids or adopt these kids would never be given the histories either because of the confidentiality of the parents. So, at the end of the, every day, there would be a child who would refuse to get on the bus and ask if he could go home with me. And I didn't really understand the depth of that request until I had my own son, or the honor of trust that he had bestowed upon me. He had very, very good reasons for not wanting to go home at the end of the day. And most have been put in the program by court order um, because of family situations. And as I said, because of privacy laws, their histories were not shared with their foster. They were confidential. So you wouldn't know if you got one of these kids if you accidentally triggered a trauma by some innocent statement or action. Think about that for a moment. They were left without the information they needed to understand that child that was now their responsibility and part of their family. So, nine years after I left that job at Children's Hospital, the shooting at Columbine happened and I was living down in Virginia Beach and I had cable TV then and I watched it as it was unfolding and of course I was horrified and I cried that night, but not just for the families and not just for the kids who were gone, but I cried for the shooters. Because every time one of these kids goes off the deep end, I don't see their mug shots and their social media pics with the guns and the hatred that they're spewing forth on those posts. I see the little faces of those children that I loved every one. And how amazed I was they could even have survived and adapted and played despite the conditions they grew up in. And it also made me cry when I heard the most horrible yet understandable hatred being poured like acid towards the memories of those boys and their families. And they were just boys. So after the Columbine shooting, I started praying for the shooters every night. And I had a really powerful dream about a week later. I dreamt I was in a school cafeteria and it was full of kids and it was loud. And you remember how that was like, it was echoey and it was a little chaotic as school cafeterias tend to be. And Dylan and Eric walked into the cafeteria with their guns and you could feel the fear and the kids were hitting the ground trying to be invisible. But I stood up instead and they saw me and they recognized me and they put their guns down and they came over and they hugged me. And they said, I love you. And I knew it was because I had seen them, the children that they used to be, and that they still were. And they heard my prayers. No one got shot in my dream. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So I found this beautiful allegory on Facebook recently. Tara Brock, thank you wherever you are. Imagine you're walking in the woods and you see a small dog sitting by a tree. And as you approach it, it suddenly lunges at you, teeth bared, and you are frightened and angry. But then you notice one of its legs is caught in a trap. And immediately your mood shifts from anger to concern. You see that the dog's aggression is coming from a place of vulnerability and pain. This applies to all of us when we behave in hurtful ways. It is because we are caught in some kind of trap. 
The more we look through the eyes of wisdom at ourselves and one another, the more we cultivate a compassionate heart. It's funny how we usually can forgive family and friends much easier than we can forgive people we don't know. If we knew their stories, we would never be condemning them. And we need to acknowledge that we don't, we can never know the whole of someone's story. I learned an awful lot from working with those little kids. Kids and dogs have a remarkable ability to forgive until we as adults teach them otherwise. If only we would let them be our example. One day I had two little boys taking them to the bathroom down the hall. They were best buddies most of the time. Joey and Anthony, one was five, one was six. They looked like little angels. They did not act as you would expect little angels to act, however. So when we got to the bathroom, they went into stalls that were right next to one another. And they were laughing and talking on the way in. And after a moment, a commotion ensued in the bathroom. And when they came out, Anthony had a big smile on his face. And Joey was red-faced furious. And his head was wet. And I had to keep him from Anthony because he flew at him. And I asked him what in the world happened. And he said, pointing at Anthony, he peed on my head. <laughs> and I looked at Anthony, who was still beaming, and asked, why in the world would you do that, Anthony? And he said, because he kept looking at me from under the stall, and I told him that if he kept doing that, I would pee on his head. And he did it again. So, good boundaries and good communication, actually. I had to keep myself from smiling, but Joey was, was really, really upset. So they didn't speak to each other on the way back to class. I had one on each side. I took them back. Then I had to take Joey back to the classroom and get him cleaned up a little and calm him down. So about five minutes later, I was back in the classroom, and I looked over and I heard some commotion again. And Joey and Anthony had their arms around each other, and they were playing. And the whole incident was forgotten. Or maybe just forgiven, but it was never mentioned again. So recently, another thing I saw on social media, there are some good things on social media, was by um, the author Glennon Doyle Melton. Its story was in Reader's Digest, and it was about a teacher that she met that works with one of her small children about how one teacher is doing her part to make sure that her kids don't fall between the cracks. So every Friday afternoon, she asks her students to take out a piece of paper and ask them to write down the names of four children they'd like to sit with the following week. And the children know that their request might not be honored, but they get to request. And she also asked them to nominate one student who they believe has been an exceptional citizen of their classroom, and all the ballots are private, and they go to her at the end of the day. So every single Friday afternoon, after her students go home, she takes out those slips of paper, and she lays them out in front of her, and she studies them, and she looks for patterns. Who is not getting requested by anyone else? Who can't think of anyone to request? Who never gets noticed enough to be nominated? Who had a million friends last week and none this week? She's not looking to figure out a new seating chart or who the exceptional children are. She's looking for the lonely, for those who are struggling to connect with the other children the ones who are falling through the cracks of the class's social life. And she can pin down right away who's doing the bullying and who is being bullied. She says that what this teacher is doing is like taking an x-ray of the classroom to see beneath the surface and into the hearts of the students. But what we really need are sonograms because they're done with sound, they're done with listening. 
We need to be listening to each other's stories in order to see past the surface. And when we do that, we realize we are all examples, the teachers, the neighbors, the strangers in the store who let someone go ahead of you because they might be having a hard day and they're dealing with a couple toddlers. The people who get honked at for stopping to give the homeless a handout on the street or a kind word, not judging where they've been or what they're gonna do, but seeing that they have their stories every single one. And what we can do, what can we do besides being a good example every day as we go about our lives, how do we refrain from judging and how do we forgive? The first thing is to admit that we never know everyone's story. We never know someone's story. And don't take photos of people while they're eating because that rarely turns out good. And I play my own little game that helps me not to react when unexpectedly faced with that little dog growling under the tree. My game is called What If? And I literally do this all the time. So, what if the person who just honked at me for not going fast enough is trying to get home because the babysitter's late and their kid will be getting off the bus and no one will be there? What if the cashier who just snapped at you just found out her mother had cancer? We've all been those places. What if? And I picture what that person looked like as a child. And I try to see them at about three or four years old when their innocence still shone out of their eyes. And all they wanted was just to be loved and for everyone to see how wonderful they really were. Because secretly, that's all we want. And those children are still there behind our eyes, if you just imagine. If you just say, what if? 